Leaders in business all say that they support marketing communications uh, or Marcoms, but there's a big problem in that a lot of people don't truly understand exactly what Marcoms is. Sure, they've got an idea, but that's a long way off having an intricate understanding and appreciation of what it is, why it's important, and how to make sure it's done well. A solid execution of Marcoms is integral to business success, but particularly right now where there are likely to be cutbacks, now more than ever, if you work in Marcoms, you need to make sure that everyone in the business understands what you do, why it's important. After all, if you're fighting a fire, you don't turn off the water because it's critical. So unless everyone sees your work as being critical, there is a risk you could inadvertently get cut off. Hello and good afternoon. My name's James Rostance and this is the 414 Live, live this Thursday afternoon, exclusive to LinkedIn Live. So the 414 is for you if you're a professional B2B marketer, whether you work in-house at a company or if you work in an agency, or indeed if you're a, a business professional with a hands-on role in your company's sales and marketing endeavors. Now, each and every week, I get to interview some of the greatest and most interesting minds in B2B marketing so that you can directly expand and enhance your professional knowledge each and every week so that you can ultimately deliver better results for your company and be even more awesome in what you do. So this week, we're looking into marketing communications or Marcoms and truly appreciating and understanding what it is and why it's important. And uh, joining me live from Brixton in London to explain more about this, please welcome Mr. Dominic Walters. Dominic, good afternoon. Good afternoon, James. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, from Brixton. Yes, yes. First one of 2021 as well. I had to d dust things off, uh, but we're here live on the air. And <laughs> thank you so much for joining. This is going to be nice. Um, so to give the um, the, the audience uh, a bit of a backstory on this, uh, uh, Dominic was good enough to send me his new book. I'm, I'm holding it up on screen now. Harnessing the Power at Your Fingertips, uh, where you dive deep into uh, marketing communications, what it is and why it's important. And uh, I love that as a topic because, uh, yeah, as I said just then, it's... Uh, super relevant and important right now and all being well uh, integral to everyone's success so with that could i start just by asking you how do you like to define uh marketing communications in your own <laughs> words wow i mean that's the million dollar question <laughs> i think if you would look that up in a dictionary you'd find many many different um uh descriptions of it for me um and i know we're going to deep dive into into this topic later during the course of the show but at a high level, marketing communications is a tool, it's a discipline, it's a, a powerful force, it's a function that I would say when used well, correctly, can really drive growth, accelerate um, your strategies, and in effect, more importantly, add value, dollar value to your business. And that's what's, um, for me, the, the, the exciting part and the exciting power of marketing communications. I think there's something else that I'm, I'm really kind of keen on, and you, you've actually been doing this very well. You use the phrase marketing communications, and um, a lot of people will use those two words separately. Mm. And marketing communications, for me, is absolutely the power horse. It's those two words brought together that is the game changer. They both independently have a key role to play, but the magic happens when those two work together and people really understand what that means. It sounds like it's really a, about understanding, I guess, first and foremost with this. Is that uh, about right? Yes, I, I think you, you need to grasp what what you're dealing with like anything if you yeah. don't understand how to use the tools at your fingertips if you don't know what they can do for you you can never really get the most out of it and i think that has to be the starting point for anything like this just as you know you would expect your your chief financial officer to be a, a whiz at the finances understanding the regulatory landscape financial reporting the 
the the deal the auditing of the books all of that is is key and they understand why that's so important in order for you to look at success and failure profit and loss how you're doing against all of your metrics and measurements in the same way it's really critical that leaders understand what marketing communications can do for you and your business and why it's so critical so what do people normally then get wrong uh, about marketing communications and what are the common misconceptions Mm. <laughs> a lot but um, uh, what do they get wrong I think I think it's really um, the starting point is if you go to a lot of um, business leaders out there mm. I think they would genuinely say they they believe that marketing communications is important to their business but if pressed and then are asked why I think that's where we begin to see a divergence of various reasons and rationales as to why they think marketing communications exists in their organization. The worst being, and I think many people in marketing communications will, will, will know this and have heard these kinds of phrases, you know, uh, a boss, a department coming in saying, hey, can you add some fairy, sprinkle some fairy dust on our, on our presentation? Can you make our event look good? <laughs> and for me, that's hugely frustrating when I hear that because it really, in a way, it belittles yeah. what is something that can be so fundamental to driving strategic growth. It kind of makes makes you sound like you're a group of individuals running around and all you're doing is making presentations or, or putting wrapping paper around something when ultimately the strategy <laughs> of a marketing communications campaign is, is core to the overarching strategy of a business. So I think it's, it's misunderstanding what and why you do it. The other thing that, that goes horribly wrong is structure. And mm. the, the, the area, and I've been talking about the word marketing communications, but when you divorce those two words, you automatically have a problem. Because when you start divorcing marketing communications, you start divorcing disciplines and experts who sit under that. So what you, you end up having is you may suddenly see your PR team sitting in one part of the business, your internal comms team sitting in another part of the business or under a different leader. You may have your government relations team sitting under someone else. Then if you start looking at the marketing elements, you might have your creative team sitting somewhere or your agency reporting into a different member of the C-suite. Your digital team may be sitting under IT you suddenly end up with this array of, of silos, reporting lines, verticals, and you've already set your marketing communications opportunities have been basically structured in set, such a way that you're gonna fail. When I say fail, you're gonna fail to deliver a powerful outcome. You won't fail to deliver a press release. You won't fail to maintain a website, but that's not powerful outcomes, that's just, breathing. That's just keeping the lights on. And that's where I get really frustrated. The opportunity is there is to deliver powerful outcomes or just keep some lights on. And that's where mistakes happen. So what then would you prescribe as, say, the right way to view marketing communications to give it to, to, to finally nail it, as it were? <laughs> to finally nail it. Um, <laughs> Well, I think, I think we, we may be a long way off there, but I think from my perspective, I start with one word, which is integrated. It's a totally overused word. I accept that. I acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. But for me, integrated marketing communications is the starting point. And what that means is everything you do in that equation, you have to think of as one collective group of skills, disciplines, firing on all cylinders to drive to one objective or a few objectives. Of course, you never have one sole objective. But when you look at a company strategy, you have to look at it as a group of individuals who then look at their various um, unique powers, if you like, and you leverage each of them at each stage of the journey. So mm -hmm. the way I look at it sometimes, if I, if I break that apart, what I don't do is I don't look at a press release and issue one press release, hit the front cover of the Times tomorrow morning or the New Wall Street Journal and say, job done. That's not success to me. That's great. And I'd be pleased with that. But that, that particular 
publishing um, success needs to be a building block to the next stage of my strategy. It needs to be then driving to the next stage. And these are just building blocks. And those building blocks are all brought together by a huge array of different professionals, experts, whether that be the video um, production team, whether that be the digital team, the copywriting team, the graphics, the PR team, the government relations team. We, all of those individuals have a role to play, but they should be working together in harmony towards one outcome or a few outcomes. When they all work against each other, what you end up having is verticals and silos competing against budgets, all working to very different objectives because they will probably be reporting to different leadership members who all have a slightly different perspective on what they think their team should be doing. So you're diluting and every time you dilute, you dilute, you dilute further and further and further and you end up with this, this sort of very um, weak, impactful campaigns. So integrated is absolutely the starting point. Everyone needs to sit together, work together, and work towards a strategy that is a, a sort of collective outcome for everyone. Right. So if anything, I can see how that would tie into, I guess, how we introduce the show of how unless um, the business as a whole, but particularly leadership as well, sees um, everyone's combined effort as being as being key, then if, uh, and to borrow your, your, your phrase there, silos, if you see individual departments as silos, that's surely where the risk of um, being affected by cutbacks or being seen as not as important, uh, is, is that um, the right way to view it, would you say? Well, I, I think that's a very, I mean, it's a very interesting point you make. And clearly, if you have um, diluted and divided up what is already, you know, what is an important element of your business, and that has been broken down into many tiny elements, mm -hmm. they're already weak. If at that point, the company is going through and the world as we are now going through challenging times where naturally many businesses are looking at budget cuts, you then start cutting budgets of something that's already weak. If it's, you know, so you have little weak elements out there, each of them being cut even further, you suddenly have to ask the question is, can actually these elements do their job effectively and efficiently anymore? Whereas mm -hmm. when you're working as a big collective, there is power in a group. You can then decide where you point your firepower. If you have to take a 10% cut, you can say, fine, we're going to do a little less here and a little less there. But it's easier to make those judgment calls when you're all working together and where you'll amplify and switch, well, I suppose, turn up the volume, turn down the volume. You, can, you have greater control over that when you're working with a large group of specialists. Right. Um, th this comes to, I, I guess, something uh, where myself and you were, were talking um, before uh, doing the show is that um, marketers generally uh, have a bit of a problem in marketing themselves uh, in terms of making sure that other elements within the business appreciate their value. Uh, is, uh, would that be a, a good time to maybe cover that uh, as, a, um, as, as a thread? Yes. I mean, I think what I'd like to do is divide that into two. Uh -huh. um, just to go back to our last last point about budgets, and it, it's, it's, it's one of my bugbears a little is, um, uh -huh. and you asked me earlier, how do I describe marketing communications? Uh -huh. One of the areas at its most simplistic is, I sometimes use this phrase, is your marketing communications team is your first line of defense in a crisis. When you think about marketing communications, it's out there to build and drive your reputation, but it's also out there to protect your reputation. And protecting it is what a lot of companies are seeing now. So sometimes I have to ask myself the question is, why is marketing communications one of the first budgets to be cut hmm. when a crisis hits? Hmm. And yet, they're the first individuals everyone has to turn to to say, ah, our business is under fire in the press. Our reputation is under fire at the moment. And they're expected to find solutions to all of these things, build reputation, protect reputation, um, drive growth, create a story around what might be a budget cut, and yet they're the ones who are impacted first. It's, it's a curious sort of problem that I see out there, which brings me back to your question now, which is, you know, are we 
um, are we sometimes doing a disservice to ourselves and our profession? And I think the answer is absolutely. Um, we, you know, when you see the best marketers out there, they absolutely write a powerful strategy that has a very solid budget. That budget, um, and though is is directly related to metrics, those metrics will show um, what we're trying to achieve, why we're trying to achieve it. But most importantly, they'll also show how that strategy directly relates to the corporate strategy, to the business's strategy. And as you break down your marketing communication strategy, you might have elements. Each of those elements should show what they're doing for your overarching corporate strategy. We're not, I think, or there are many people out there that I've seen campaigns and strategies that don't really go into that level of detail. So when you're under scrutiny from the C-suite and they look at it, they're, they're going to see a strategy and a budget that doesn't really stack up against all the other departments, the IT department, the finance department, the strategy department, et cetera, et cetera, the pro product team. They're all writing absolutely key big budget plans that relate to long-term planning, costs, what it relates to, how we're going to deliver it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they all have metrics. We as a profession have not been great. We're a lot better than we were a decade ago, but we haven't been great at this, um, and that can be a problem. Yes. Um... I like that uh, the the adage of uh, something's only expensive un unless you appreciate the value of it. Uh, so that, by the sounds of it, would very much apply to this. Is is that un unless uh, company management appreciate the value of what it is that your marketing communications team bring to the table, uh, then, uh, as with the fire hydrant example or the, the the water supply example, you're at risk of getting cut off. Uh, so. Um, that's something that I, I guess that that's, uh, the audience needs to bear in mind. Uh, it'd be a good time at this point actually to say, if you've got a particular question you'd like to put to Dominic, please do put it in the comments section uh, below or uh, to the side, depending if you're watching on mobile or online. Uh, if you've got a specific question about strategy or tactics which you'd like to put to Dominic, please do uh, put it in now and I will ask him. Uh, hello to Holly Loopy, by the way. Uh, she's watching this afternoon and she's giving you a double clappy hand symbol uh, for content thus far. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about real world benefits uh, of uh, taking this approach. What are the real world benefits uh, of um, taking this approach to marketing communications? Wow, I mean, real world benefits. I, I think I think the starting point, and I, I will. I'm not going to, you know. Mm. Um, get bored of using the word integrated marketing communications and i hope you guys won't out there but <laughs> i think the real world is when you bring that together that's and and when you break that down i think it becomes clear why that is so valuable to an organization so the, the starting point for me is when you have all of those teams working together it's logical that you're going to have a much more powerful outcome you're not going to have a web team doing something completely different to a PR team and an advertising team going off to do something with a sales team and another team going off and doing something independently. What you're going to have is a group of individuals all working together at a moment in time, powerfully amplifying your strategy, your story, your objectives. So it's a no brainer that it's going to be a lot louder. The noise is going to be bigger. It's going to be more impactful for when you actually do and take out activity and do act, take action. The other part, though, is when you think about it, and I think the CFOs in the world will like this, is when you deliver like that, you also could save the business money. Because if you think about all of these siloed um, teams sitting across the business, they're all asking for budget. And there is a ch I've seen it time and again, you then see duplication of effort. Those budgets are being asked for, money is being spent quite often to do similar activities. If actually you all work together, you can probably save a little bit of money, which either, I, I don't like to admit this, could be given back to the CFO, or could be spent to do even more marketing communications and accelerate even faster into the outcomes. So I think that's you know an important message out there for businesses and for marketers to understand is really good marketing communications, well-integrated teams can actually deliver more powerful stuff for slightly less money. 
I think the other point is in a real world term, well, adding dollar value to the, to the brand. Um, and we talked and you mentioned earlier about the importance of helping um, the, the leadership understand why marketing in communications is so important. Well, adding value to your brand is adding value to the company as a whole. So, you know, underlying value creation is a key element of what marketing communications and good marketers can actually do. There's another really important benefit of it. I think there's one other area I'd like to touch on, which I, I hope we'll deep dive, but it's yeah. also good Marcoms can energize an entire company. And I'm going to leave that just hanging there for a moment, but good marketing communications can energize a whole company and an energized company is something that really can't be underestimated. I really like your, uh, uh, description, I, I guess, of, of the case whereby with the individual, well, um, units within uh, the um, organization working together, uh, you're able to um, produce results that are louder and bigger. Uh, first of all, that I thought was good. Uh, but then in terms of uh, uh, budget, where you said that uh, if you're working more efficiently, uh, you, you're th then likely to be able to, uh, did you describe it as uh, give budget back or, or not use it as much? Um, what was the exact uh, way you... Um... Well, I mean, I, I kind of said, you know, I think CFOs out there would love this. We yeah. might be able to give a little bit of money back. Clearly, no one in marketing wants to be doing that and, and no budget holder anyway wants to be giving money back to the CFO at the end <laughs> of the year. But there is a chance if you become more effective, more efficient in your, in your strategy and your delivery, you might be able to. Or I would argue, therefore, you can actually amplify even further and get even further faster with your strategy. Um, so, you know, there is something about being more effective and more efficient with the way you structure your teams, you look upon a marketing communications function, you look at the skills you require, and then how you leverage that can actually give you so much more room for maneuver as well. I think what I took away from that is, is that, um, I mean, treating the CFO there as a customer, or they say an internal customer, uh, that's likely to garner respect, I would imagine. That's, uh, you're, were you to be in a situation where you, you, you've performed optimally and, and extre extremely efficiently to deliver great results, uh, you're in a situation where you haven't used up that entire budget. Uh, as a customer, I would imagine that, that you would likely to go, oh, well, thank you. You know, you've, you've clearly gone above and beyond because the standard way of working is to use up everything that you're given. Uh, but in, in that sense, I would imagine that it, w it could end up in a, in a takeaway where the CFO sees you as delivering really good work and very good value for money, therefore would be even further likely to not put you at the front of the queue for any cutbacks <laughs> in the future. There we go. That was, that was the point that I was getting to. James, I... I love I love your um, your positivity. <laughs> I would love to say that is the case. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think you know any organisation, any leader in an organisation should be working to the most effective, efficient um, outcomes, and should be prepared to give money back. And in the tough times, every department, regardless of where you sit, should sit back and see how can we help. Ultimately, you're all in it together. You know, I, I use the term integrated marketing communications, but ultimately, every part of that, all, every discipline, every function, the operations, the back office, the, the product development team, the sales team, you know, everyone is in it together. You've, you, you've all got a collective responsibility. And if you don't look upon your company in that way, then you're, you're already kind of putting yourself down a level. You're taking yourself away from that potential for success. Um, so... I always believe that you should hand money back if you can. The flip side of that is, and a culture that I, I have seen less of now, but certainly if you go back a decade, if you handed money back at the end of the year, you would be told you'd have even less the year after. Yeah. So no one ever wanted to give money back because you saw this diminishing budget every year. They said, oh, you didn't spend all your budget last year. And instead of being told that you're well done, respect you for that, hugely efficient, you were actually penalized the next year. So there's this thing, you know, it needs to be a sort of a holistic approach from all sides of the equation to show that, that everyone is working together for the, um, the good of the, the company. 
That's a tough one. You know what? I, I, I would very much like to pursue that line of thought on uh, on an episode, I, I guess, with someone in a CFO capacity, because I imagine that actually comes from from their direction or their thinking. So, mm, yeah, that's one for another episode. But <laughs> thank you for the acknowledgement on that. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's talk about mistakes then. Uh, uh, key, uh, what, what was my note say? Uh, what are the key issues and mistakes to avoid in putting this all together? Um, well, I think that the, the first mistake is is to go off blindly and um, and just get on with something. I mean, it sounds obvious, but so many people are rather reactive. And what what the best marketeers out there are doing is they're taking a step back. They're looking at the long term horizon, and that long term horizon is not a, a three or four month. It's a you know it can be a two, three, four year. You look at your long term horizon, and then along that horizon, you start plotting out. Um, short-term milestones. Now, to a lot of people, and this is where the problems, or, or not problems, this is where the difference between great marketing and what I would say is day-to-day -day marketing is great marketing will be looking at the long-term horizon, plotting out those milestones along the journey. Each of those milestones could be an enormous output activity, but they are only part of a journey you're going on. And that's where you're really working with the leadership and you are part of that leadership, taking that company on its journey. Just as a CFO is commercially looking at how over a four year period he is going to look at the commercial viability of the business, you as the head of marketing is looking how we're going to take this company on that journey. So I think one of the big mistakes is reactive short termism. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think that happens more often than, than we'd like to see. And, and part of that is because some of those short term uh, milestones or plans are still enormous in their own right. I think one of the other mistakes, and, and whether I call it a mistake, it, it's more of a, I think a lot of marketing professionals get demoralized and I understand why. And it goes back to your very first question is why are we misunderstood? And because so often marketing communications and how important and critical it should be seen and how important it is to the organization, um, how, how, you know, when it's not seen in that way, it can be very demoralizing for a team. So when good marketers are pushed back time and again, time and again, time and again, they kind of give up and I, I get it. I, I can see why, you know, you, you get frustrated. So what I'd say is just keep plugging away. I think it's really important, regardless of that, keep pushing away, putting your great ideas on the table. And it only takes two or three of your ideas to be accepted and for you to show how good they are and the difference they can make to begin to change the credibility of your team. And that's quite important. Well, in that case, what would be a good example, or even, well, let's do better that. What would be, what would be a great example of this done well? Don't shoot me. I'm going to pick two. Go on. And one of them is from my career. I hope you'll accept that. Oh, for but sure. Yeah, the yeah, first yeah. one is actually, <laughs> yeah. one of the, the first one I'm going to pick, and we haven't touched on employee communications, and maybe we'll come, come, come back to it, but yeah. Vodafone. Um, Vodafone, probably in about, I can't remember the exact date. It might have been 2007, 2008, approximately. Um, looked at its internal um, workforce and saw, I don't know, they must have had two, 300,000 employees around the world. And they realized how fundamental they were to everything. And they created this campaign called Red, Rock Solid and Restless. But there are so many internal campaigns that are really superficial. It's probably the most polite word I can <laughs> use. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what Vodafone did was they pulled out Red Rock Solid and Restless, and it wasn't just three clever words. They actually showed all of their employees what that meant and how each of them, when they need to think about their work and their job, could return to those words and would help them make decisions. So if I remember rightly, Red was about passion. Be passionate and do your job passionately. Be excited about everything you do. If something doesn't excite you, should you be doing it? Rock solid was we always want to deliver something that is brilliant, that is absolutely solid, that is, you know, it's been tried, tested. So you can imagine 
for a technology company or a telco, they have a huge amount of complex technology out there. It had to work first time brilliantly for the customers. There's none of this, you know, delivering um, any technology that sort of half works. It's sort of disconnecting all that. That wasn't acceptable. Rock Solid was about a brilliant foundation. And Restless was all about breaking boundaries. You know, if the competition is doing that, let's let's not do what they're all doing. Let's think of something new. Let's be innovative. Now, when you translate that into your day to day job, you go, right. So I'm sitting in the company and I want to think of an idea, whether you're sitting in the bookkeeping team, the retail front of house operations. You can then ask yourself the question, is this idea I have? Is it red? Is it rock solid? Is it restless? And I think they kind of apply this formula. If it's only if it only you can only tick one out of three, then forget it. If you can tick two out of three, definitely take it a bit further. If you can tick three out of three, you've got a brilliant idea there. Let's run with it. And it was a really lovely way to empower employees, but also give them a decision making process that was being used from the C-suite right down to the factory floor. It really clever and a lovely campaign that energized but involved everyone but was clever, gave everyone a reason why. So I, I, I love that. Um, you asked me and I said I was going to tell you a bit about a campaign that I, I did. Well, actually, yeah, yeah. playing so, back, well. you know, looking at long-term strategies, I, I, I most recently was um, the VP of Marketing Communications at Inmarsat Aviation, and I joined them in about um, late 2015 with the remit of um, helping this organization put itself on the map now, don't get me wrong, Inmarsat Aviation had some amazing products in those days, but what it was doing was changing its strategy and it was about to unveil one of the most powerful connectivity solutions to the commercial airline market. But when I went to the airline market, our prospective target audiences and customers out there and, and asked them, and we did some research and looked at Inmarsat Aviation's recognition only about three or four percent of our target audience had ever heard of us. And of that, a tiny proportion, it was 0.6 percent, knew we were involved in aviation. So I, was, I basically discovered I had 18 months to turn Inmarsat around, get it into the market, get it launched, get it credible and begin to win market share. So what I did at that period was look at the long term strategy and I took this as actually a four year strategy. And I started with, and this is where I say, look at the long term and then look at the small milestones along that journey. And the first milestone was, how do I get everyone to know we exist? And that was disruption. And it was about behaving like a rather spoiled teenager. And we launched onto the market in 2016, kicking and screaming, wailing. And everyone looked at this rather spoiled child who arrived on the scene. And we're going, who the hell is that? And after that, it was about then beginning to educate. Once we had kind of got everyone's attention, it was quickly to educate the industry and say, look, this is why we're here. This is what we have. And begin to help everyone understand the power of what was being provided by Inmarsat Aviation to that industry and why it was so important. Then we moved into a credibility phase because it's all well and good saying we have this. But then it was demonstrating why this was so powerful and why it can benefit the commercial airline industry. Really important part of the journey we went on. And then finally, it was the taking the business into a leadership um, positioning piece. And really, as you track through that journey, what we did was we went through using a whole host of different mechanisms, whether they be powerful thought leadership, whether that be advertising, programmatic, copywriting, PR, media, and employee. Employee engagement was fundamental to kick this off, and we wouldn't have succeeded without that side of the equation. We went through this journey, and by the time I left, we'd just won 50, we were winning something like 40 to 50 percent of all contracts that came into the market. Damn. So we'd move from this kind of minnow where no one had kind of really knew us Damn. to absolutely a leader. And that was how we reflected our story, our narrative, and our marketing communications over that journey. And, that, and we lived and breathed in hand in hand with our sales force, who were a critical part of this as well. And it was a really interesting journey to have gone in. And, and one which I, I look back on and you know immensely proud of, but really, in a way, is a great example of looking at the long-term journey you need to go, take, a, take an organization on, but then looking at the individual small milestones, and there may be many on that way, but you then can track your success because you know what the light at the end of the tunnel is. 
And, uh, and that was all that started by you uh, figuratively misbehaving as well. <laughs> that was a nice start yeah, to that figuratively story. Figuratively misbehaving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, that would... Uh, and when I was a teenager... Well, you know what? I, I, I'm a big believer in keeping hold of your inner youth because that can work to your advantage. And uh, yeah, and what with yeah, a, a 50% market uh, share, did you say that was, or 50% uh, conversion? Uh, 50% was... of all, all contracts that came into mar in, into the market to be won were won by us at that point <laughs> outside North America. Excellent. So very, very, um, you know, significant growth. And, and let me be clear, that's not just not just down to marketing communications. But it, it's to demonstrate how important marketing communications is when you start from not even being known out there. Mm. Well, in that case, that would link beautifully to uh, Alex Gilligan's uh, question. Good afternoon, Alex. Thank you for this. Uh, he asks, uh, should marketers give greater focus towards briefing other internal teams on uh, the marketing function and value? Uh, with respect to doing this outside of live activity and refreshing regularly? I, I think that's a really good question. And, and I, would, I would absolutely advocate um, running many sessions to try and highlight uh, the importance of marketing communications. And obviously not in, a, in an arrogant way, but mm -hmm. in a collegiate way, supporting, how do you support the rest of the business, demonstrating how you do support it through examples of what you've done, but equally explaining how and breaking down different parts of the business, how you can work with them. Because the other point is you've got, and I don't think anyone is, is a customer. There is no single customer. Everyone in an organization is a customer to a customer. So James, yeah. you mentioned um, the CFO and them being a customer. They are a customer, but I would argue that to the marketing team, the CFO is a customer, but actually um, the marketing team is equally in reverse, you know, should be seen as a customer to the CFO. We're all doing a job. We're all building reputations and we're all working for each other. So really good question. Yes, you should be promoting the success out there. You should absolutely be um, reminding people of the narrative and the story of the organization because, um, you know, we'll go back to this, but your employee is your ambassador. So the marketing communications team are responsible for ensuring that everyone understands the story of that organization. And if they don't understand it, how can you expect them to be out there and be an amazing brand ambassador? So any opportunity to share the story, show what you do and show how you can help is a really great thing to do. Perfect. Hey. And with you saying uh, that's right there, that gives them, uh, Alex has put a massive uh, yellow thumbs up there for uh, response. Nice. Yes. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate that. Uh, well, actually, you wanted to um, cover about employee communications. Did you want to um, cover that in more detail now then in that case? Well, I just I, th I think it's one of the I, I talked about, you know, the various elements of what brings it all together. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the really important starting points for any good campaign or any good marketing communications long term view is you've got to have your employees and your colleagues on side. It's not just your sales force. They're really critical. Um, but it's your, your employees, all of them. You have an organization, whether you're 50 people or 50,000 or 500,000, those are 500,000 voices that can either be saying the right thing or the wrong thing. And if they're saying the wrong thing, or if a large proportion of them are saying the wrong thing, they're competing against your message at the top of the, of the, of the, of the pie, if you like. Mm. So if I'm out there doing good PR, doing good advertising, doing, doing good digital whatever, and the leadership is out there and we've got great thought leadership, but actually I've got 500,000 people who are saying completely the opposite, we have a problem. And it's, it's diluting and impacting all of that hard work that we're doing on the surface. So your starting point needs to be at a basic level to win over those, those employees. That's a starting point. They need to understand what you're doing. But actually, if you energize them and excite them, and when I take the example of Inmarsat Aviation, we excited and energized 250 people. And they were so excited, they became a really powerful part of our story and getting the message out to the aviation industry. Because in, in something like aviation, everyone is really technically a specialist. They're all experts in their field. So they're talking to so many other people in that field. You want them all to be really positive and understand what they need to be positive about. 
Um, so your employee base is fundamentally important to your brand and your marketing strategy. And too often, employee communications is seen just as a sort of an element that communicates HR messaging, pension messaging, all these other messaging. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But they are also the most powerful army of advocates for your organization. And that's often forgotten. So my message is mobilize your employees before you start the rest of your strategy because you're missing a trick and it's free. They're a free vehicle to tell your story. Nice. Right, in that case, uh, I guess I should um, uh, give you my penultimate question, uh, which is um, what do you see as being uh, the key elements for success in doing all of this? Wow. Wow. Um... I think it, 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 it comes down to a, a, a number of areas. One is we want to be seen as a credible um, uh, value adding function, discipline, profession. So we need to really think strategically when we come up with plans. Mm. We, need to, we need to really understand what the organization is, is doing. And when we write a strategy and we prepare a budget and, and we look at our campaigns, my first tip is make sure that it directly relates to the long-term objectives of the business and make sure you directly show the expensive activities and expensive is different for everyone. If you're working for a BP, an expensive campaign will be seen as different too if you're working for you know, a full man agency. But whatever you see as expensive, make sure you relate that and demonstrate what that activity is trying to achieve. Also make sure that every activity is not standalone. Make sure that they all work together in harmony to drive and amplify across a journey over a longer period of time because it just makes everything more impactful and it gives your campaign an amazing foundation because you're building upon a really firm element that as you amplify and amplify, everything is sitting on this first starting block. I touched on your employees. Make sure you engage and, and amplify through them first. They are really important advocates for you. I think the other point is integration. Make sure that you are integrated. Good marketing communications brings together all the disciplines. Now, if you're not senior enough and you're not sitting at the C-suite level, then you need to just you know, put in that extra effort to pull the right colleagues together and work with them and work with them before budget period. Ensure that when you all put your budgets together, you really are understanding what you're all doing in a long-term strategy and how each of you are working together and that you don't see budgets being diluted um, or duplicated because that, that really can harm you. I think the other thing is, is more of a, a broader topic. What, what people can do is also remember that marketing communications is a vital standalone part of the organization. And I, I, I kind of talk about this because... Mm -hmm. Sales is often seen as, as sort of the most important element and marketing communications defers to it somewhere along the line. Sales is critical, but marketing and communications is also critical and they're not identical. And the way I look at it is marketing communications is fundamental to sales succeeding and is fundamental to the sales process and they have to work hand in hand. But marketing communications is not sales alone. Marketing communications has so many other jobs to do. And remember that because you have to be out there building reputations. You have to be out there filling the pipeline. You have to be out there protecting your leadership. You have to be out there looking at the regulatory environment, the government environment. And there are so many other aspects and elements of a good marketing communications function. And it's not just, you know, whether we've done a sale or not. I think the other part, which, you know, and then I will be quiet, I promise, James, is um, what I kind of call the sales cycle, as I touched on sales, and I don't think we've really dropped into this, is marketing communications is really important throughout the entire sales cycle. And it's really important that there's a strong partnership is created between the sales team and the marketing communications team. And I use sort of this analogy of something, you know, Newton's cradle. If you can all imagine those balls that knock together, you've probably all seen them, had them one stage in your life. You pull off a ball and then it hits the next ball and the next ball along. Sometimes when I'm sitting down with senior leadership and they go, can you show me where marketing communications involvement is on a signature on a contract? Hmm. And it's not always that easy. 
And I know that. And I know a lot of you out there and a lot of marketeers stumble at that point. Well, what I'd say is look at Newton's cradle and the first three to four balls on that cradle in a marketing sales process can only be achieved if marketing communications does that job. Absolutely. The last three balls on that cradle are being driven and owned by sales. No question about it. But you can't get to those last three if you haven't kicked off the first three. And part of those is building awareness, building credibility, build, building familiarity, being understood, um, being trusted. All of that has to start. There's an interesting statistic came out last year where it was something like most um, purchases and most conversations, sales conversations, do not start until a prospect has already got 60% down the sales funnel. So if you think about that, they're not going to pick up the phone to a salesperson until they're already 60% down their thinking. All of that thinking is reliant on marketing communications, building credibility, amplifying the story, explaining who you are, getting out in the press, building thought leadership. Who's doing it all? So very important to remember that and not be disillusioned or occasionally bullied into the corner. <laughs> Hell no. I think that's an uh, awesome statistic, by the way, as, uh, as well. 60% uh, of the, uh, of, do you call it the journey? Uh, in relation to the... Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose you call it the sales journey. It's a sales journey. It's the customer journey. It's, it's as they start looking out there to see, you know, who they want to be um, doing business with. They start investigating them, start learning more about it. They're, remember, they're looking at your website. They're Googling you. They're looking at your, your, um, your, your news articles. They're looking at the materials, the collateral out there, looking at videos about you. They're listening to what other people say about you. All of that's happening before they actually pick up the phone. Um, and where is all of that material? Who's shaped that story? Who's created that brand? Who's built that reputation? Who, who's created the excitement? Yes, uh, the proverbial coloring in department. Yes, much more. Exactly, <laughs> the, the fairy dust department. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm holding myself back from me surmising uh, what you've covered today. And, and this has been uh, gold. And I, I, I really do hope uh, the audience has, has got something good f from this. But uh, rather than me surmise it, could you, in your own words, uh, give us what you would like uh, everyone listening and watching to take away from all of this? Wow, we've covered so much. I think, you know, yeah. trying to keep it short, not one of my strengths. Um, I think be proud of what you do and recognize that marketing communications is fundamental to a business. It's not a nice to have. Remember that the most powerful marketing communications comes when an integrated marketing communications team and strategy pulls together and is delivered. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid to actually hand money back because you've actually done something really well and cost effectively. It'll gain credibility. I think probably the final point will be to actually say, remember that when you're um, and we're back. Right, sorry about that. Uh, we lost Dominic's uh, live link just then, so we're just going to uh, record this now and add this to the end of the video and and for the podcast for you to see. So, uh, welcome back into the room, uh, Mr. Dominic Walters, live from Brixton. So, uh, Dominic, you were in the middle of. Uh, no, no, that's all wordy. Let me let me try this another way. So it was the key takeaways. Just key takeaways. Yes. Can you it, just give us the key takeaways? I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. And we're back. Right. Sorry about that, folks. We lost the live link to Dominic there in uh, Brixton, but he's back with us now. And uh, we were just about to Dominic. Uh, have you uh, recap and uh, give us the key takeaways for what you'd like the audience to uh, have from all of this. Well, thank you for having me. And I think that the, the, there are two or three very important things to take out from my perspective. Mm -hmm. One is be proud of what you do. Marketing communications is fundamental to business success and we should all recognize that. Number two is integrated, deliver integrated, marketing communications, both in your strategies, i.e. the disciplines you bring together, but also the way you structure yourselves. That's really important. I think thirdly is when you write a marketing strategy, 
be very careful that you align all of your tactics, activities to a long-term outcome with every milestone absolutely showing how it's going to make a difference to the company's objective. And finally, I would say, have fun. We're in one of the most fun professions, I think, in the world. Go and enjoy it. And when you enjoy it, you're going to make a massive difference. That's a nice note to end on. Dominic, thank you ever so much for today. This has been a, a solid start to 2021. Uh, the technical issues aside, but content, because content is king. Uh, what you've covered today has been really awesome. Now, before we go, actually, uh, you have got your new book and you were very kind enough to send it to me. So um, would you like to uh, tell us uh, a bit about that briefly and also where people can go to find out more? Because I think that would be a great thing to do. Well, right. I think today has all been um, my book and um, it really is. I wrote the book because I love marketing communications and I want everyone to understand how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. The book's called Harnessing the Power at Your Fingertips and it's available at um, harnessingthepower.net. Perfect. So please, if you're interested, learn more there. there Thank you, James. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Well, hey, uh, Mr. Dominic Walters, live from Brixton. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, if you've enjoyed watching, then please do subscribe if you're not already. Uh, web address on screen. There we go. www.the414.net for all previous episodes and for all previous subscription options. That's it. So each and every week, I speak with some of the greatest and most interesting minds in B2B marketing so that you can directly expand and enhance your professional knowledge with every episode. There we go. Well... I've been James Rostance, and I will still be James Rostance, uh, but uh, please join me here same time next week for more of the 414 Live.